Hello everyone, welcome back to Lessons Learned. This is episode 17? 17. 17. We are talking about Jordan Peterson's book, Maps of Meaning. I'm Dylan. And I'm Evan. And we're doing a little bit of new format, so instead of my little one-liner, I'm going to give us a summary. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for this episode, Peterson is arguing that myths and stories about paradise, such as the Garden of Eden, represent a time in human history when we were not aware that we could die. Not only that, but at this time, we were more like animals, so we didn't think about ourselves as people. We just kind of focused on surviving day to day. Uh, because of this, the biblical fall from paradise represents the moment in time when we became aware of our own mortality. Let's talk about that, and welcome to our new set. All right, guys, welcome to this new set. We have a couple uh, adjustments that we've made, um, mostly focused on discussion here. Um, we also have decided to put the book up front um, and something that I, I, I felt adamant about addressing um, that we are no longer going to address to the extent we were um, is all of the comments we get. There's a lot of people that say things like, oh, well, you guys aren't even talking about Jordan Peterson. How are you proving him wrong or good job? Like you think you're as smart as Jordan Peterson. Look, let me just be brief. This entire series is about this book, Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning. It will change and the new book will come up front, clear as day. Two, we really like Jordan Peterson. We're actually very big fans of what his, he does and his works and stuff. This happens to be an older book and there's some things we disagree with, but we've never claimed to be smarter or as smart as Jordan Peterson. We're actually both very big fans of his work and stuff. Mm -hmm. And all we're trying to do here is bring to light, haha, um, the perspective of like a young Christian. I don't man. think we've ever brought up the brought to light aspect of this. And we're not going to. Okay. But I th I felt that while that was fine and dandy to talk about, something else was a little bit more pertinent that Evan agreed with me on. And it's that Jordan Peterson right now is being under investigation, you know, kind of a court thing, um, by Canada's uh, Psychiatric University. The uni it's um, University of Toronto. Yeah. So if if you're here because you like Jordan Peterson, go support him. Be aware of that and go support him. If you're here because you like us and don't know about Jordan Peterson, we are vouching. Go support him. Go do whatever we need to do to stand against us. Because what's happening is Jordan Peterson made some tweets and made some comments that were very general. Never called anyone out. He just said simple things. He's even retweeted people. And now he's under attack. People are saying that they're offended and all these big ordeals. And the problem is, is it doesn't stop at Jordan Peterson. The problem is it doesn't stop at Jordan Peterson. He's a great guy. He's very smart, but it doesn't stop there. What's next? So if they can take away Jordan Peterson's psychiatric license, if they can say you cannot practice this anymore, well, what's them to stop them from taking away anybody else's title? or anybody else's position, or throwing anybody else under the bus. So, a little more of a serious note, but we want to kind of get into that a little bit because we feel it's very important to address, um, not only in supporting somebody that we look up to and, you know, hold in high regards, but also because, I mean, these are our rights, guys. Like, this is a very real world that we live in, and people are trying to take them away. I know you, you were, we're here in the U.S., and we're in a rather fortunate circumstance, but we're on that road. We're going down the same road as Canada. So let's stand up for that. Don't don't be wishy-washy. If you support Jordan Peterson, if you support what he does, go support him right now. But with that being said, mm -hmm. I think it's about high time we talk about the book on this legendary set. Legendary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... <clears throat> Well, I, I agree with everything he said. He already said at the beginning, but I'll just reinforce that. And it's been reinforced. And uh, as much as we do support him, there is some stuff we disagree with in what we're going over today. <laughs> but we support him nonetheless. We love this guy. You don't have to wrong. agree on everything. No, absolutely not. Each other. So, and, and we're just trying to foster some good discussion here. Mm -hmm. That's all we want. Exactly. So this section is talking about paradise 
Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to start off by going over kind of some characteristics of what Paradise looks like. What do you think? What are some general characteristics of Paradise? Okay, so I, I want to bring up that, for starters, Paradise is very subjective, I would say. Okay. So what I think Paradise is versus someone else, and especially like in today's society, like secular Paradise versus Christian Paradise, mm. I would I would ledge, you know, step out on the ledge and consider that secular Paradise might look like drinking, partying, sex and and just things that bring you pleasures in life Mm -hmm. whereas a christian paradise looks very different i mean you know it breaks down to kind of like well it's uh heaven (laughs) yes that's an easy one that's the right answer but i think the ultimate thing is like when considering paradise what are you considering Mm -hmm. the temporary satisfaction you get in the moment or the eternal satisfaction or the more permanent thing would you rather take the the night out drinking or the night in learning about something and okay. i mean not every learning's not everyone's cup of tea but i'd say paradise ultimately ends up being subjective okay fair enough cool. he's he's going for more of a mythological paradise mm. like palm trees sure yeah that's actually his top one is palm trees I got um, it. No, so so he starts off by talking about ideas of, of paradise encompassing a previous place of stability. Okay. So they are we think of them from a place that is not paradise. Right. Because obviously we're not in paradise. So we think of paradise biblically speaking especially and in a lot of these stories um as a place that we lost long ago. I assume you're talking about Eden. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or other paradise stories in general. Okay. It's, so it's some place that was lost so, long ago. Okay. So other mythologies have this idea of Eden. Mm-hmm. This, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. I follow. So that's one aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, another one is that in paradise, suffering does not exist. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, he says, perfect. there's a perfect harmony of order and chaos, which eliminates suffering while bringing forth the necessities and pleasures of life without work or effort. Mm, okay. So I think secular or Christian, you can agree with that. Yeah. I think for us, obviously, we know that when Adam was there with Eve, there was work to be done. But it was but like... It was, yeah, it was simple. easy work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and then the punishment after the fall of man was... Made work harder. You will work by the sweat of your brow. Yeah. So it's like, how easy was work before? <laughs> what right. kind of paradise did Adam give up? Exactly. So so that's another aspect. Okay. Is that suffering does not exist. Um, this one's a little bit more abstract, but he gives a really good example to help us understand this one. All right. And this is one we might disagree with, but I think it leads us into a really interesting spot. Mm-hmm. So he says that uh, repre- it's representative of a time before consciousness. Okay. And the reason that it's before consciousness is because consciousness brings with it awareness of bad things. Mm. So it's kind of the idea of uh, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. You're not aware of bad things, so you're in this state where everything's great. Yeah. Is pretty much what he says paradise is. Well, and in uh in the biblical perspective, it's it's before Adam and Eve ate the tree yeah. of good, good and, and evil. Yeah. yeah. Tree of knowledge of good and evil becomes yeah. a big part of what mm. he focuses on. Okay. So I'm very intrigued where this is going. So yeah, so a way to understand this consciousness part a little bit better because it is really impactful for his interpretation of this. Mm-hmm. Because you know, what we have to remember is that he's coming from the evolutionary standpoint. Okay. So he's trying to explain these stories in a way that fits into the evolution narrative. Okay. So I think even if we disagree with some of it, I think it still leads us to some interesting stuff. So he says that it paradise is like childhood. Okay. So childhood represents an existence prior to the discovery of mortality. So when you're a child, you don't really think about... well. I think it's a big deal for a lot of kids when they first kind of understand the idea of death Mm -hmm. and mortality. And that kind of changes your whole world because suddenly someone can be gone forever. Yes. Including yourself. But it's like, that doesn't hit, you could be like four and Mm -hmm. you know, somebody died and it doesn't hit you. Mm -hmm. Like it has to be comprehended. I Mm -hmm. think is, and maybe you said that and it it glossed over my head, but like, okay. Yeah. I mean, 
I mean, I think the core thing is comprehension yeah. and like awareness of it because you, I feel like you see a lot of young kids that are in that situation where something drastic has hit them in their life and it's very impactful and we're like, oh my word. But it doesn't mean anything. They didn't right, understand exactly. it. Yeah. And so he says that childhood is in a way idyllic. Okay. It's like a paradise because it's not contaminated by death. And that's the phrase he uses quite a bit mm. is that paradise is not contaminated by death. Interesting. So, yes, I agree. Um, <laughs> sorry. So Yes, I agree. Good. He he talks a little bit about mature or maturing mm-hmm. when a child matures. Uh, he, he talks about how it means the expansion of ability. Okay. But that that ability can't go in every direction so that potential is going to be lost certain potential is going to be lost yeah. because you can do less the more you focus on right um so that was something it didn't super relate to the paradise part but he talked about child development a little bit mm-hmm. i think he just was random rambling probably but gotcha something else we do get out of the childlike state is growth therefore also means decline as each step towards adulthood is one step closer to death. Hmm. So while we are growing from at childhood to adolescence to adulthood, it is growth, but it's also decline in the sense that you're getting closer and closer to death and you're losing more and more potential. I, I get it. Like, I definitely get where he's going with this. I think, and again, I, I, our, our pastor does such a good job during sermons mm-hmm. and I'm like very inclined to bring a lot of topics back to what he says, but he was talking about, and I know we go to the same church, yeah. <laughs> so it's like I'm rehashing this, but he talks about like in Ecclesiastes, uh, mm-hmm. how King Solomon's talking about like children yeah, um, or rather he's King Solomon's talking about vanity and our pastor relates that to children um, and specifically In Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2 through 3, he says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And I think that's really, one, a different kind of viewpoint than what Jordan Peterson's talking about. But Mm -hmm. more importantly, I think one that's definitely worth considering. Because while, like, I get what Jordan Peterson's saying where it's like, well, you know, you get older and you start needing to focus on things because things Mm -hmm. get harder. Mm -hmm. I mean, like riding a bike. Cool. That's easy. Okay. Well, now you want to ride a dirt bike. Well, they make dirt bikes that auto shift and stuff, you know, and then it gets a little harder. Now you have to have a clutch and, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things to consider. So what Solomon ultimately, uh, talks about and what our pastor makes kind of a simplized version is that when you look at a kid, they're, they're full of happiness and wonder Mm -hmm. with bubbles. Yeah. Just soapy bubbles. And then as we get older, we're like, well, I want bigger and better things. And I think that's in part because we are growing and, and learning about more complex things. But I think it's like this. Well, and I think that they're able to be fascinated by something that's that simple because they haven't been exposed to so many things that everything Mm -hmm. becomes just you know, not meaningless, but it just becomes the norm. Yeah. So yeah. it's like something as cool as a bubble. It is, it's amazing. Well, because like, it, how does it float? Right. And like, obviously for us, it's like, well, you know, the soap and water, mm-hmm. it, it's not nearly heavy enough for it to like fall through the air, like a lead balloon or anything. And there's, it's mostly water. So it's like, yeah, of course it floats. Yeah. But for a kid, it's like this glossy, I mean, it looks almost like oil. It looks like mm-hmm. rainbows. Like mm-hmm. that's awesome. Yeah. And as we like delve into like the complexity of things, we want bigger and things. I think the important thing is that like as a child, that mm-hmm. perspective of like wonder is what makes the bubble so great. Right. Whereas and I, as we I get... think that's also part of this paradisal mm-hmm. state or this idyllic yeah. state is that Adam and Eve. So it's interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about paradise lost either this episode or next episode. I think it's this episode, mm-hmm. but we'll talk about how, once they, once Eve has a bite of the apple from the tree of knowledge of good, good and evil, mm-hmm. she pretty much starts like scheming to convince Adam to do what she wants and stuff. Really? And she, it's kind of just this, and obviously 
it's basically a fan fiction for the Bible. So it's not that's cute biblical, <laughs> but I think it does play on important ideas from the Bible mm -hmm. because Milton was a uh, Christian. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that the things that provided enjoyment before can become a place of corruption post fall. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And that's part of this consciousness thing that we'll learn a little bit more about. Okay. From Peterson. Okay. So okay. He's, he says also that the Garden of Eden was before known separated from unknown. Mm -hmm. So they kind of just acted without comprehending that they didn't know things. It's more like an animal. Like they just do stuff. They don't really yeah. think about it. And maybe there's some some exceptions. Like dolphins are pretty smart and stuff. Well, but I mean, I, I think we can... I think we can safely assume that it's not like Adam and Eve were dumb, mm -hmm. you know, I mean like, and we'll, yeah, we'll go into how they were conscious, mm -hmm. but that's different oh. than self-conscious. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, look at a baby. Mm -hmm. They're definitely conscious, but not self-conscious. Yeah. Cause like it, it's, it's not until like you get older and that's why it's the more idyllic state. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into how that works. Yeah. That's interesting because like thinking about how like the Bible works, like children are free of sin. Well, what, what's it? what constitutes as a child mm -hmm. one who is unself con like does not have self-conscious thoughts because they, they just aren't capable of it wait what do you mean that they're free of sin well doesn't god say that children are free of sin like no no well everyone it's original sin everyone has fallen mm -hmm. everyone sins have i been lied to maybe oh no everybody's listening to me realize that i was told something less than the truth well and i mean <clears throat> there's probably more nuance to it than that mm -hmm. but like kids aren't perfect no right so they would have to sin right because the only way they wouldn't is if they were perfect mm. so this is, this is turned into you teaching me two lessons that's fine <laughs> it's lessons learned not lesson learned yeah so <laughs> not lesson learned <laughs> yeah so we'll keep moving um it is nonetheless this is just a quote from him okay that i didn't think i could paraphrase without just taking away from it sure so he says it's nonetheless the case that the origin of experience and history appears inexorably linked or bound up with differences from the origin okay so what he's saying is that our origin of experience and where our history starts is defined as being different from our origin. And if that's like the parad paradisal origin or paradisal origin, history is different from that place. Okay. I, as a place where we act. So he he's not... Okay, so he's saying that where we're coming from is... he To him, it's separate from history. Kind of because we didn't experience stuff in the same way. Okay, so it, it, it's like a like an acknowledgement of like our perception changing as we get older. Kind of, yeah. Okay, yeah, because well, because like when you were a kid. Well, and you also have to remember that he's doing this from an evolutionary perspective. Mm, okay. Where, for him, history started where we could start experiencing things. Mm -hmm. Before that, we were more like animals. Okay. So the people that were first conscious or self-conscious mm -hmm. and had experience mm -hmm. and could think of themselves individually and stuff, mm -hmm. those people could kind of remember back to a time before that mm. when it felt all like paradise because they weren't self-conscious and stuff. And, and is he saying that can apply to us as like we reflect on like childhood? He uses that as a metaphor to understand it. Okay. But no, he's this is like his version of interpreting the what paradise actually is. Okay, interesting. He thinks that's where that story comes from. That's kind of confusing, but like I get it. I get where yeah. I get where you're going okay. with. It. I, I'm. This is going to go in a di very different direction than some of it. I'm initially anticipating some of it's still really interesting. I think. Okay. And later we'll talk about his his kind of what does this mean. Okay. If it is us becoming aware of our own death and mm -hmm. that's when we fell, what does that mean? How do we deal with that? And that part's really interesting, I think. So, but to get there, we have to go through the fall. Right. So here's him talking about the fall into consciousness. Okay. So to kind of restate the creation myth is a metaphor uh, of human beings coming into consciousness. 
is how he sees it from this evolutionary perspective. All right. Okay. So he talks about a couple of metaphors. One of them is that separation of light and dark that's in the Bible. Mm-hmm. So he sees that as light being consciousness and dark being unconsciousness with how when you're awake, you are conscious. When you're asleep, you literally are unconscious. Right. Um, hmm. So he, he see, he's making a connection between light and dark, day and night, being consciousness and unconsciousness. From a biblical perspective? Or just from all pers- like he's all taking mythologies. he's just taking from the biblical story okay. right now. Is when when before God did this, everything was together. Mm-hmm. That's when we weren't aware of ourselves and stuff like that. Or we right. or maybe that was when we weren't conscious was before that. And but, then suddenly we're conscious and unconscious, and that's that day and night. But God didn't separate that until after he made man, right? No, he or, did sorry, that he, first. He did that before he made man. Yes. So why but because it's it's not going to be a one to one connection that he's trying to make here. Interesting. So yeah, so there's the there's a light and dark day and night reference. Um that represents our own noticing of ourselves. And maybe that's where that comes in when Adam is created is when that's when we noticed ourselves kind of. Um hmm. But he says that Adam and Eve before the fall our purely conscious awareness, which is what we were talking about with animals or like kids, little kids, mm-hmm. is that they're conscious, but maybe they're not self-conscious. Right. So he's saying that that's what Adam and Eve were before the fall. Yes. He says that before they understood good and evil, so that before they ate the apple, mm-hmm. they were much less troubled, obviously, because they were just living in the paradisal state. Right. But they were much less as people. So what do you think? Were they complete before they knew about good and evil as people? Uh, and were they lesser people without knowing about good and evil? Mm, okay, that's a very interesting question you've decided to pose. And you don't have to have a good answer because that's a really complicated and deep well, question that okay. I don't know if either of us can fully answer. I don't, okay. but I don't think either one of us could ever really fully answer a question but that's from the perspective of the only there is a truth mm-hmm. there there isn't that's not right. subjective that there is a truth or right. the truth and the only being three beings whatever you want to however you want to view it to know the truth is god the son the holy spirit yeah so but what what would you speculate <sighs> do you think you need to know about good and evil to be a person no okay because ultimately our purpose as humans with souls created mm-hmm. by God is to go back home in a sense to we fell and we where we were removed from Eden. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and that, that was our paradise. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and we weren't allowed to live there because we disobeyed God. So ultimately the goal in this life, as we've kind of talked about, it's like a trial ground. Like, do you have the faith? Obviously we're going to falter. We, we are fallen people. Mm-hmm. We, we will falter. But are we going to stand the test of time? Are we going to go through these hardships and in our failures and in the times we fall, get back up and go, well, you know what? I learned from this and I'm going to do better next time. And, and that's the goal is to get to eternal glory with God. Mm-hmm. Okay. Why would we need the trial ground to get to God if we could have just never not been with God? That that's that's I think the Christian answer. Yeah, let me let me push back a little bit mm-hmm. and see if I can poke a hole. If if they didn't know about good and evil, mm-hmm. then they by definition could not have done as many things as we can do. Sure, because we know about good and evil. Okay, so is it good that you could go shoot a heroin? No, okay. but. Does, Does that, it, would that make you more of a person being able to do something that would only harm you, mm-hmm. literally only harm you? And I think, I don't, I don't think so. I, right. But I think that this is the source of this question is what mm-hmm. does it mean to be a person? Yeah. Because if you think that it's based on having a soul, mm-hmm. which is maybe closer to what we would think. Right. Then, yeah, you don't need to know about good and evil to be a full person. No. 
but if it's based on more of a i think it's nietzsche nietzschean idea mm -hmm. of becoming a person mm -hmm. that would mean yeah if you can't act in as many ways you are less of a person see and i just i disagree with so, that. so well okay so i don't let me push back on that okay so if if the if the saying is that because you can't do as many things, mm -hmm. you're less of a person. Mm -hmm. So what about somebody with no legs? They can't do things that you and me can do. Does that make them less of a person? Right. So if that doesn't make them less of a person, I don't see how not being able to do good or not being. Well, able to do actually, bad no, things... it is different because it's we're specifically talking about consciousness mm -hmm. and what your mental capacity is. Like, okay, fine. Like so what let you... me go with a different handicap. Let's look at somebody who's mentally handicapped. Sure. Somebody, let, not even like somebody who's, you know, autistic think... or has Down syndrome, but somebody who got into an accident. Well, I think the difference is being aware or not being sure. able to be self-aware. So what about somebody who isn't self-aware? Somebody who, who was in an accident, you know, let's say a motorcycle well... accident and, and they... And, and they can't use their arms anymore. Like mm -hmm. they, their brain and motor skills just aren't. But they're still self-aware because they know sure. that they exist. Okay. So then. the What he's saying is that because they aren't self-aware, mm -hmm. that they are less of people. But are you not self-aware if you just aren't aware of bad? I, I think, I, I do think it just comes down to definition. Sure. So, and he does never define what being a person is, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. And I don't want to speculate too much what he thinks it yeah. is. We should just call him right now. We'll just call him being Jordan Peterson for anyone confused. Yeah. Um, we'll call him. We'll act. You know what? We can actually Skype him and we'll put him on the TV. That's perfect. Hey, hey, Dr. Jordan Peterson. We have this podcast and um, do you just want to be on our TV, please? Yeah, exactly. I bet he'll do it. Yeah. Is it worth getting rid of the fireplace? I like the fireplace. I like the fireplace too. I don't know. That's a hard one. That's harder than the question you just asked. To keep or not to keep the fireplace. That is the I question. I know. So, you know, I don't know if there's a good answer, but I think it is something that Christians can struggle to think about. I, I, I think mean, in today's world, I think I think I liked your answer, but I can, I can see how it's difficult to come to a conclusion given the way we think about ourselves today. Right. And I, I think the hardest thing is just like our answers, our answers will vary mm -hmm. in somebody else who's Christians answers will vary. And then yeah. people who aren't Christian, their answers will definitely vary. Mm -hmm. So it's well, and I, I can get like feeling like you don't, I can understand feeling like less of a person mm -hmm. if you can't act in as many ways. Right. You know? But if you never even comprehended that, would you say in that moment, I'm less of a person? Right. Because... And that's the thing, too, is like it said at the beginning, we're thinking about this paradise from a place that is not paradise. Right. Well, and on top of the fact, when, when you look at, like, history, like, let's reflect on history, because mm -hmm. you and me have had this conversation a lot, and... It's the trap everyone falls in. I shouldn't say everyone. It's a trap a lot of people fall into mm -hmm. where it's like, well, they look back at history and they're like, we're, we're so much smarter and so much better and much more well-educated than they are because we have X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is like, no, no, no. You're, you're looking at it with the lens of 2023. You're not looking at the lens of, you know, 1776. You know, you're not looking at it in that and that viewpoint yeah. of the time. I mean, the people then, and I mean, even look at the Renaissance, those people were brilliant. Da Vinci, mm -hmm. like brilliant. So it's like, if you were aware that you could make good and bad decisions and you saw somebody who could only make good decisions. Yeah. You would go like, Oh, they're limited They're They are bound by their inability to make the bad decisions that I can. Mm -hmm. But what if you're that person? Do you feel limited? Especially given the fact that like as fallen people and as people tempted to sin, mm -hmm. why would we want to make good decisions? I know if, if you and me were talking to God right now and he's like, hey, I can make it so you never sin again. Like I will take that away from you and you will just never do it. But with that being said, a lot of people will view that you have a limited life. 
right. I would take him on that. Are you kidding? Because that's not a limited life. Because we're called to not sin, not because it's a, it's a rule. Those are naughty things. No, it's because it actually hurts us. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, God designed us, so he set the parameters and how we should live to get the most out of life. Right. Why wouldn't we want to live in the parameters without our own flaw? Mm-hmm. I think is really what it comes down in my eyes. Sure. What's a, you know, you have more decisions, but half the decisions are bad. Are those really decisions? I don't think so. That's fair. Yeah. I don't know. It's a really tough question, especially in today's world. So did I answer it? Good. I thought it was a pretty good answer. We'll, we'll see in the comments. We'll see in the comments. <laughs> Let us know if Dylan's answer was trash. <laughs> so it, it was bad. So we'll move on to, before we get into what we do in the face of death or being okay. aware of our own mortality and mm-hmm. stuff, uh, he uses a little bit of his allegorical interpretation. So he talks for a while about snakes and what they represent. So in the biblical story, he thinks the snake is an agent and a symbol of transformation. Okay. And to preface, I think we're going to disagree with obviously some of the connections that he makes i'm assuming he's talking about genesis still from the bible yes yes okay. but it, it's important to see where he's coming from sure i think even if we disagree okay. so it's an agent of transformation obviously because the serpent brought adam and eve into consciousness from unconsciousness if we follow the way he's thinking about right. it right yep but I mean, also he did bring him into sin and stuff. So he is this agent of mm-hmm. some sort of transformation. Yeah. Either way, I think we would agree. And then as a symbol of transformation, one thing he didn't say, so maybe it's stupid that I thought it, but I thought one way of being a symbol is that snakes can shed their skin. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a thing, but he didn't like it. So he didn't say it. You're so profound. But what, I know. Thank you. <laughs> but what he did say is that, Ancient and reptilian parts of the nervous system. Mm-hmm. So the part near the brain stem and stuff that he talked about from chapter two. Yep. Uh, those can snap us into consciousness from unconsciousness mm-hmm. if there's danger nearby. Yeah. Because, you know, if you sense some danger, you can like wake up if you're asleep. Oh, yeah. Well, so you've had the feeling where you're like falling off the bed, right? And right. you're not. And yeah. you like, Ugh! and you're now you're wide awake. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So he's saying that the snake is used here as a symbol because it it also reflects that aspect of us this quote unquote reptilian part of our brains because it, you know if we're all evolved from reptiles at some point in the evolution chain and that part of the brain stem and stuff came from that time period that's where he's saying it's kind of an unconscious connection does that make sense i I don't understand what he's saying in regards to how this is relating to the Adam and Eve fall. And maybe it's just blatantly not. Well, he's just saying that if you assume that evolution is true and that our brainstem and the part that would wake us up when we're asleep, Mm -hmm. if that came from being evolved from reptiles or snakes, Mm -hmm. then... There was some sort of unconscious or implicit using of a snake in the story as something that wakes us up from unconsciousness. Okay, I totally get it now. Okay, so that's where he's coming from with that. It doesn't make sense, but I understand it. (laughs) Yeah, as Christians, we would obviously disagree. (laughs) But, But he is, I think he has a point as an agent of transformation. That's what the snake is. Because it brings this transformation. Yeah, transformation in Transformation in the neutral term. Well, in terms of they go from not knowing good and evil to knowing good and evil, and then they're fallen. Sure. I mean, it. I would still argue heavily that it's, it's transformation in a very neutral term. Mm-hmm. Because, like, you go from not knowing about drugs to knowing about drugs. Are you better now? Like, are you... No, he's not saying it's a positive right. transformation. Exactly. But I'm saying I think it's important to acknowledge that the transfer he's not saying it's a good one yeah well actually he probably is saying it's good and i because if if he (laughs) thinks it's well you know it's again it goes back to the definition of a person right so if knowing more 
leads you to being more of a person or being capable of more things mentally, Mm -hmm. then it is good. So, but either way, so that's kind of how he talks about the fall. Mm -hmm. Now we can move into, if we follow his train of thought, the paradise was a place where we weren't aware of our own mortality because we weren't self-conscious. Right. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about his, here's what that means now that we are self-conscious and aware of our own death. Mm -hmm. And I think he has some really interesting stuff. So, so he says, we as humans became aware of our own deaths when we stepped into consciousness. Because of that, we have been the most motivated to rectify that fact or kind of get redeemed from that fact Mm -hmm. by searching for redemptive information. Uh, so what he's saying is, well, this is what I was saying, but paraphrasing for him, Mm -hmm. what he's pretty much trying to get across is that once we became aware that we could die, Mm -hmm. we are trying to search for something that could like save us from that fact. Because obviously our instinct would be to not die. Yeah. So we went around looking for some information that could redeem us from death. Mm Mm-hmm. And he says, this has led to us having a boosted consciousness more than any other animal. So the boosted consciousness comes from like a clear apprehension or fear of the mortal danger. Okay. And infinite possibility lurking everywhere. So to explain that infinite possibility thing, he he pretty much goes on to explain that because our brain was designed to produce adaptation. Mm-hmm. Because it was made so that, and that's what we talked about in chapter two again. Adaptation versus evolution. Well, adaptation as in learning from new things so that we can survive better and remove the unknowns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like exploratory adaptation. Yeah. Um, Because our brain was designed to do that, but also there's infinite possibilities and there's infinite unknown Mm -hmm. because we can't know everything. Right. It is always operating and can never reach its end goal of fully exploring the unknown. Because once we became more conscious, well, so let's start back. Let's say you're an animal. I'm an animal. This is the evolutionary line of thinking. Yep. Your brain would be designed to help you figure out when something has been explored enough so that you know you're safe in a spot. Yeah. And then like you're chilling. Mm -hmm. But once you become more conscious and Mm self-aware, you realize how huge the possibilities are that exist out there Mm -hmm. in the ways that you can die. Right. To a huge level, and you're, you're never going to be able to answer all those unknowns. Well, I feel like you can see that in, in some parents mm-hmm. because it's like they're moderately aware of like <clears throat> like the dangers that can come to their child, mm-hmm. and then they start freaking out and sheltering their kid, and then that kid ends up being like, oh my gosh, there's a spider. I'm going to die. Oh my gosh, there's a frog. I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. And like everything's going to kill you. Right. Because it's like there's the you know, 0.0% chance that that spider is in fact like a brown recluse Mm -hmm. or there's the 1% chance that you live in the Amazon forest and that is like a poisonous frog or something. Right. And it's like a preposterous line of thinking, but because it's not impossible, it's, it's a threat. Right. And so, and so what he's saying is because we became aware enough to recognize that there's a bunch of stuff, Mm -hmm. our brains pretty much went into overdrive to figure out those unknowns Mm -hmm. and that's how we got such a boosted consciousness and no other animals did. Mm. Um, I, I don't know. That's what we'll disagree with because that's him trying to answer the evolutionary questions. Right. Well, I was going to say, I don't know why, but this came to mind, but think of like motocross, Mm -hmm. like the thrill seekers is where I'm going with this. Okay. They, they're like, I might die every time I take this thing off a hill. (laughs) Like, Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to how that would work. And I don't, I'm not expecting you to answer on behalf of, yeah, he doesn't talk about that. So, but I think that's something definitely to consider is like the, maybe they're the outliers. Thrill seekers. Yeah. yeah. But I mean like, cause they're like, there's thrill seekers. There's people that are like, I Mm -hmm. like roller coasters. I like fun things. And it's like, yeah, there's some concern, but I'm talking about the people that are like, um, like Ken block rest in peace, but amazing drifter. Okay. But a lot of the stuff he did was very, very, very dangerous. Right. And it like a roller coaster, you're strapped in, you're locked in. Usually they're tested if you're not at a state fair. They're pretty safe. Mm-hmm. But like he would get in a car and his life was in his hands or 
I would even argue the conditions of the roads he was on. Right. You know, when he did rally racing, like if he had a berm and that berm had been weakened by a previous driver, he has no control mm-hmm. over that. It's and very dangerous. I don't want to speculate for Peterson too much, but what he might say is that they're kind of acting as that revolutionary hero uh, willing to push the bounds of the unknown mm-hmm. to master some sort of known. The shaman. Yeah, kind of. No creative illness, but mm-hmm. so, yeah, so. He says that because our brains can never finish fully exploring everything and adapting to what they would need to to feel secure. Right. We are forever unsettled, unhappy, unsatisfied, terrified, hopeful, and awake. Oh. (laughs) And what I kind of noted about that was I think that's an evolutionary reconciliation for what we see as a spiritual problem Mm -hmm. is that we are fallen. We're on a fallen world. And we're not where we're meant to be. So it's like what he talks about in Ecclesiastes is that this world's meaningless for us. The Jordan's evolutionary answer to that is that our brains are trying to explore the unknown and they'll never be able to do that. So we are always unsatisfied, Hmm. which is really interesting. Hmm. I don't, I'm conflicted. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. One, I'll flesh it out a little bit more than while you're thinking about it. What he says a little bit later is we are unhappy because we cannot finally and completely address all of the problems of life. We are insufficient. Mm -hmm. And that's just a little bit more. He kind of changes subjects after that. So I won't go too much more, but I, again, I think as a Christian, it's, it's kind of easy to write it off. I don't, and mm-hmm. I think it's a, it's definitely questions and kind of ideas that are worth wrestling with, even as we're like, well, God, check, you know, it's the easy answer. Mm-hmm. It's always the easy answer. I'm sad. Okay, we'll pray about it. I'm angry. Okay, we'll pray about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's not to I'm, say there isn't personal responsibility. No, but I I think it's 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 reassuring and it's hard sometimes, not always, but mm-hmm. I think sometimes it's hard to really go like, well. What if, what if God isn't the easiest answer for somebody who doesn't believe? I mean, like if you're trying to help your friend who's, you know, on a difficult situation, you can't just go, well, just pray about it mm-hmm. or it, it works with my girlfriend. Yeah. You know, like you have to like try to help them through it. And obviously like you, I feel you and me would be very inclined to be like, well, you know, like I've been in this situation before, you know, this, this is how I was saved, et cetera, and try to help them lead to a longer mm-hmm. kind of lesson that has been learned to not quote her title. Wow. Thank you. Self plug. Thank you. Self plug. That's your out of the day. Um, but you know, I think we'll try to get somebody to kind of like this longer, um, enjoyment of life. But <clears throat> for somebody who like, isn't of that mindset, I think that's like a especially difficult thing to wrestle with, mm-hmm. which I would argue ultimately leads you back to Christianity, which is, I think what we've seen in Jordan Peterson. Mm -hmm. Um, As we can, we can talk about it in later episodes Mm. In a couple episodes. We'll be talking about 20th century atrocities and the professor that I'm going through it with. We have a theory that him going through that kind of, or learning about that stuff really in Mm -hmm. depth is pretty much what forced him into Christianity. Okay, and what we can talk curious. about it more later, but to give the basic version of it right now, mm-hmm. for the sake of this, pretty much it's that evil so clearly has to exist mm-hmm. based on what happened in the twentieth century. Mm-hmm. That if evil can exist at this scope, then how can good not exist as its opposite? I think he mentioned that in his series Exodus. Oh yeah, I I think he brings that up is and he might have brought that up as like because him and have you seen exodus i've watched the first episode okay i haven't started it yet but i definitely understand the premise for people who don't know he's going through the book of exodus with a bunch of people that know a lot about the bible basically so that he can eventually give a series of lectures on exodus yeah but it's really interesting and I definitely need to watch it. And I think anybody else interested in what we're talking about should definitely watch it. Mm-hmm. Bring Jordan Peterson and Christianity together. Yeah. Although at this time we're in like conflict with it. Yes. But I think that's fun. But 
I think he does make that point and he brings it up with um, like topics of what convinces people of God. And I mm-hmm. think one of them had mentioned, and maybe I'm taking this from somewhere else, but I know Peterson talked about it. One of the convincing things for some people is like, well, if, if absolute evil exists, then how could absolute good not? Right. And that's kind of where he comes from. Yeah. And I was, I was talking, well, I don't want to go too much into it, but it's fine. It's fine. So, the th- I think that because part of what he's doing doing with this book is trying to answer the is ought problem, mm-hmm. which is how do you get the what ought to be from the what is. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if part of the reason for that, it'd be super interesting to ask him about it. If part of the reason for that is because he saw those evils mm-hmm. and saw that absolute evil has to exist. Mm-hmm. But you can't say that absolute evil exists from an evolutionary background because there's nothing to say that morality is anything more than subjective and therefore evil is anything more than subjective. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So he's trying to figure out maybe potentially is our theory, Mm -hmm. a way that from this perspective that he could definitively say that evil does actually exist from a objective standpoint, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all speculation. So Jordan Peterson, I apologize if that's incorrect. I don't. But if if you want to come prove us wrong, there's a there's a spot here or on the TV. Right. There's a spot on the TV. So yeah, I don't. It was just a thought. Yeah. Because I know he talks a lot about the 20th century stuff that happened, mm-hmm. not only in this book, but in all the stuff that he talks about in lectures and that kind of thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Is that everything? No, we have a little bit more. We have a little bit more. Awesome. So he talks about, well, I'll just read this through. Right. Some of this is paraphrasing. Some of this is what he says. Mm-hmm. So he, uh, the religious accept that humans shattered the divine order. Obviously mm-hmm. with the fall. Apples and stuff. Yep. It actually says fruit. Doesn't yeah. say an apple. That's correct. Uh, this according to Jordan Peterson shows itself everywhere in the case with which we can all be made to feel guilty in the often explicitly a religious view that human existence is foreign to the natural order. So we can see that the order has been shattered even among people that aren't religious when those people say that we don't belong to the world, that human activity is detrimental to the environment, that the planet would be better off with no people on it, that our species is somehow innately disturbed or even insane. So it he's kind of saying that Christians obviously recognize and other people that believe in the Old Testament, even Muslims and Jews, um, believe that the divine order was shattered. So we're on a broken world and stuff. Right. But he's saying that even it seems like non-religious people kind of implicitly feel the same way when we when they act like we aren't part of the natural world. Hmm. So I th- I'm wondering if he's going the route of people kind of all understand that something is different. Well, I, I think you're kind of looking at, well, I shouldn't say you. I think what we are seeing mm-hmm. is his realization of like the innate parts of us as children of God that will always be present. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of that idea. in. Maybe this is a me thing because I didn't grow up in the church, Mm -hmm. but kind of like the, well, I feel like God exists. Like, I feel like that has to be a logical conclusion, Mm -hmm. but I don't have any reason to. Mm -hmm. And I was just, I I was not a Christian. Yeah. I wasn't, but like that kind of innate part of us. So I I mean. And there's people that do not feel that way. Right. Of course. But I think we can also see other things reflected in such as like, Oh, well humans don't really doesn't seem like humans really belong here. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Do you think it could be because (laughs) maybe we technically don't? Right. Yeah. Do you think that maybe just perhaps we came from this almost paradise long ago? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> no way that happened no that doesn't make sense so i don't know i think it's really interesting um to sum it up mm-hmm. 
Jordan Peterson sees paradise as a place wherein humans were not aware of their own mortality, and so when they learned that they could die, they fell from paradise. Since then, they have been trying to reconcile that fact. Mm. And he has a really good quote at the end of this section, and he says, we remain eternally hung on the cross of our own vulnerability. We can't escape the fact that we are vulnerable. We always have to deal with that. Really good. I'm really glad he's a Christian now because he can write more cool stuff like that with a <laughs> exactly. little bit more intention. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's that. What do you think? I We're going to do a new thing so people know. We're going to end each of these with kind of a question, give you something to think about for the week. Yeah. So, um, and you know. Anything before we get to that? I, I mean, I th- thought it was really intriguing yeah John, was a discussion i honestly my favorite part was um the question you ended up posing about like are you really a person if you don't know good and evil yeah and before yeah. we get to the question we want to ask everyone that you want to ask everyone that i can see in front of me but yeah i didn't even write it i i think that is a good question it's sub question to the main question yeah that's fine what like what do you guys think you know what are can you be a person if you aren't conscious of good and evil like if you're not self-conscious are you a person let you know what know. we think yeah let us know yeah and to hit you with the one two punch oh one two another question and the the question that i usually pose so that people know is going to be focused on the subject of the next episode mm-hmm. so you can get thinking about it before that episode starts so this question is jordan peterson says that people fail to understand the nature of evil why do you think that people deny the always possible nature of evil or in other words why do you think people deny the fact that evil can always happen within all of us yeah so that's the question uh Tune in next week to find out what we think and what Jordan Peterson thinks. What else you got? Uh, I, that's it. He He's kind of taken the outros I, I, out of my hands. I like it. I kind of like it. Yeah, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. You go cool. ahead and close this episode. That's it. Well, thanks for watching Lessons Learned, everybody. Uh, I hope, let us know if you like the new format or not. I think it felt a lot better. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to be less quote-centric and paraphrase it a bit more and make it a bit more flowy so let us know if that kind of came across or not let us know about the setup let us know if there's other fun stuff you want us to talk about we're always open to new ideas yeah enjoy your week until next time bye bye